think. Yep, and we do have the recording in progress. Um, recorded message, though, I'm sure you all heard. Well, I heard it anyway. hope I wasn't the only one um, to, to kind of kick things off. Okay, all right. So I think I've kind of gone through everything. Um, as I say, please feel free to add comments uh, and questions in the chat as we go through. Um, so to begin with, I'll hand over to Nina, who's going to introduce our, our first um, substantive item, really. Um, uh, over to you, Nina. Hey, thanks, Kevin, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's beautiful and sunny where I am at the moment, so it makes a change from the heavy downpours of the last two days. So I hope you've got some sunshine where you are, too. Um, what I was going to suggest was if people wanted to put their name and organisation in the chat um, and also just to add, if you have had any learning, um, either sharing learning with another country or you visited another country, if you could put your name, organisation and just the name of the country or countries that you've been involved with um, as part of your work in criminal justice, that would be fantastic. And then we can hopefully draw on those later in the chat when we um, talk about sort of members experience of doing international work. Um, but as Kevin uh, said, um, unfortunately, Raphael couldn't make it today because it is scheduled, but I did have a fantastic uh, conversation with him and Angela, who could make it today, who, which is great. Um, and so I'm going to show you, it was a long discussion, so I've just taken a sort of a highlight in the middle. But um, after uh, this, the whole recording will be there. So there's a few other questions that, um, uh, that I asked them as well that you'll get to hear. But I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and play the recording. Uh, lose the keys. Okay. Simple, but they just don't do it. That's frustrating. Yeah, and I was going to sort of reflect really, obviously both of you are both sort of in the business of communicating out to the wider public, you know, about prisons, about criminal justice, about the stories of people impacted, you know, sort of by the criminal justice system. <laughs> You know, why, why do you do that? Why do you think that effective communication with the public on these issues is so important? And what more, you know, could we be doing as CJA and our members be doing and others be doing to sort of help to change that narrative, to unblock that blocker that you've just described there, Raphael? Well, I mean, for me, it's about changing people's perceptions of what prison, what criminality, what crime, what individuals that get caught up in the system. It's always been about changing people's perceptions because from personal experience, I know how I was judged and how people were easily persuaded to, to label me in a particular way. So for me, one of the key drivers is this hidden world of prison, criminals, crime. Very few people really understand it that are not caught up in the criminal justice system. So your members and people like me and Angie who are involved in this space, um, we, we kind of understand it because we have deep insight. The public don't. And I know that because I get hundreds of messages from people around the globe who some for the first time will say, oh my God, I really believe that people should be locked up and we throw away the key for what they've done. But actually more can be done to address the underlying problems. They never really talk about the crimes of the individuals that I feature in the shows that I work on. They talk about the conditioning of those individuals or the conditions that they're in or the lack of, of, of ability to, to, to change the environment that can make those people come out of prison be good people if they go into prison in the first place. So for me, it's about changing people's perception, changing the narrative. And I know that is something that we in this space often try to do. And I think it's winning. I, I really do think that there, it's starting to, 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 to win over people and people are starting to see crime, criminality, prisons, and people that are caught up in this system slightly differently um, because it does touch us all. So it's about perceptions, changing the public's perception, change the public's perception, you win their support, you win their support, you influence policy decision makers or politicians or the people that are really in a position to make a change. And that for me is key. And, and I think this is what Raphael's Netflix series does really well. You kind of go into watching it thinking you're going to see these, you know, just these really exciting inside of prison walls for the first time. And it doesn't shove it down your neck that, OK, prisons are bad. It doesn't sell that message. It really appeals to an audience of people who perhaps aren't yet converted to this idea that prisons are a terrible thing. And you get to the end of every single episode and just think, how can this not change people's perceptions? And I think it does that incredibly well 
to a new audience. And I suppose that's kind of the, I was trying to follow that kind of method in writing the book. I didn't want to write a book that was just preaching to the choir. I wanted to write a book that it argues against any economic points of view as to why prisons should exist. It, it argues against any public safety reasons as to why public um, prisons should exist. And I wanted to kind of arm people with the a, a strong argument against this, oh, but prison works, it's a holiday camp. I wanted people to be able to go away and be like, well, actually, this is the truth. Um, so yeah, trying to, trying to kind of follow that method of not just, not just um, talking to people who already believe in this, as Raphael does, was incredibly important. And I think that's what we can all do. We can all start having these difficult conversations within our families, within our communities, um, and and that's how we start to shift the narrative. But I think, as Raphael says, like we're winning people over, and in a cost of living crisis, we have to care about where every single penny of our taxes get spent and if it's on something that doesn't work that's something that I think everyone can start to care about and understand absolutely I think one of the things that you know in your podcast series as well the second Charles podcast Rafael, is around kind of who are the voices that are also having you know like kind of having these conversations and and, and change and sort of um, trying to reduce stigma and to um, explore you know people's lived experiences around the criminal justice system and what they're doing. And I don't know if you just want to sort of say a little bit about the Second Chance podcast and, and your thoughts about why you set that up as well and, and how you want that to contribute to this. Yeah, no, it's an interesting right. one because the, the, the idea behind the Second Chance was obviously developed during the lockdown period. You know, we were all kind of twiddling their thumbs and I was like mm -hmm. everybody else, you know, as an international journalist, I was unable to get on a plane and go and tell people about what's going on in some godforsaken place within their criminal justice system. So I thought, OK, I, I was having a conversation with someone who sort of said, you know, your second chance. And I'm kind of like, well, hold on a minute. I, I fought long and hard to win back my freedom, having been wrongly convicted. So I was not given a second chance. I took a second chance, you know, at changing my predicament, my situation by finding a resilience within myself, finding the strength. And so that's how the Second Chance podcast was born. You know, I wanted to explore whether people deserve a second chance, whether they should be given a second chance, what it actually means for both perpetrator, victim, or other people who are experiencing a trauma or challenge in their life where a second chance on. has given them an opportunity <laughs> change the direction the of their life oh or somebody oh. else's life There's and so I no started to invite people on who had been through the criminal justice system who could talk to the fact that you know something someone an opportunity yeah, led them to change yeah. their way of thinking therefore maybe their criminal behavior now. or fine, their treatment of people who are caught up in the criminal justice system whether it was because you know they came face yeah, to face I went with an in individual to the microphone and changed it to the headphones Hello. sorry I can hear that someone's uh, not on mute and just chatting so it might mean that people can't hear it so if everyone could put themselves on mute that would be great thank you who they saw needed help as opposed to punishment so I talked to a variety of different people on the podcast about what a second chance means to them or whether they give people a second chance whether people who have been committed of some uh, who have committed some of the most horrendous crimes or have done something to somebody deserve a, a, a second chance but it's more than that it's about people kind of sharing what lessons they've learned what what direction they went in and how they now use their lived experience whatever that is as a prison officer as a social worker as a prisoner a perpetrator a sex offender a murderer you know a police officer whatever it is what it is that they've learned that they can offer that can change again the narrative or something within the criminal justice system to improve it and and i think we get a lot my last guest for example multi-zillionaire you know dot com founder who ended up you know in the gambling business ends up going to a federal prison for 45 days and lost hundreds of millions of pounds but now just that 45 days in prison 
has given him the momentum to try and help other people because what he witnessed in prison, a world that was so far from his kind of 12 million pound mansion in Malibu, which he, he talks about, has now been touched by the lives of those being incarcerated in the United States. And so he has given up some of his own personal wealth to try and improve that situation. But more importantly, he's talking about that situation. He has a voice. People who would not, but they'd listen to him in terms of business and the gambling world and multi-million pound conversations, but now he's talking about the plight of others who are in a predicament that is either through no fault of their own because of their social economical background. So that is what I think that the, the podcast is doing, not just here in the UK, because I speak to people across the globe uh, uh, around these issues. And I think it's delivering a very, very powerful message to people who wouldn't otherwise, you know, have the opportunity to listen to these stories and think, oh God, well, I, there, there is something in that for me. So it resonates with people from all walks of life. That's my aim and ambition. Yeah, and I think this is something you do really well in the book as well, Andrew, is around that, those sort of personal stories, I think, and kind of humanising, you know, um, people that, that's something that came across really strongly in, in your book. Was that part of your kind of thought process? And Yeah, absolutely. I think that the numbers can be really overwhelming when we say there's 90,000 people in prison and, you know, 12,000 are on remand and 3,000 are IPP. It, it just becomes such big numbers that it just doesn't seem real. and I also think when the numbers of like the cost of things, so 18 billion on reoffending per year, these kind of, it, it just makes no sense. And I think if you take it down to the human level and tell a real human story of someone who has been impacted by these things and then pull out and explain, okay, this is happening 10,000 times over. It's just so much easier to digest and understand if you don't have lived experience of that. So that was something I was really, considered about when I was writing that the human story is vital um, and that that's what inspired me to write the book I wanted to tell the stories of people who are voiceless and aren't heard but then I wanted to draw out and say okay there are 10,000 people who are currently on remand in prison there are 10,000 people who are trying to trying to get into rehab and try and pull the picture out so people could see the broader context of it as well I think what I found, I, I read uh, Angie's book, and I think what I found really interesting from my perspective was, was the tone, the tone of the book. You know, often when we read books, I say often, I mean, I know lots of people write different books about different elements of the criminal justice system, prison, courts, police, etc. I think what I found really interesting about Criminal, Angie's book, is the tone and how I was impressed by somebody who wasn't a prisoner, somebody who wasn't, you know, narrating this book from the perspective of a prisoner, which is often the case, but somebody who understood and got into the nuances and the nitty gritty of what life is like in prison for prisoners from a, a, a slightly a, a slightly a slight distance because mm -hmm. of your position as a social worker and i thought it was really gritty really raw and really honest in terms of you know right or wrong uh, and and for me the reason that's powerful is because we often in the criminal justice system people who work in this space lose the bravado to speak openly and honestly because i think there is a fear of lashback or being questioned or not getting their message across and i think sometimes we have to be as brave as angie was in her book to say it as it is and i think that is for me so important that you say it as it is even if it offends people who don't want to hear it that way because you feel in order to to get a politician to listen to what you have to say you have to articulate it in a particular way for them to understand well no if that politician doesn't want to listen to you in your own voice so be it you, you you know you have to just be brave and bold and say it as it is and i think you do that extremely well in your book and i'm a critical kind of book film watcher of anything criminal justice having been in that space for so long and and not judging people you know when you talk about people who have committed uh, uh, sexual offenses and and the importance behind why it's necessary to try and rehabilitate if they can be rehabilitated. And I know your argument is very different, but I just think bold, brave and, and direct um, can lead to such change, um, especially for the public. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the 
the theme of this sort of members meeting, the CGA meeting, is around kind of taking global perspectives because, um, you know, we've just come back from uh, trips uh, in the Czech Republic, in the Netherlands, as you mentioned, Rafael, where they're kind of, you know, having can't fill their prisons which is great and also to Slovakia which was really interesting where we had a prison governor there say you know we've realized if you build prisons we fill them you know so we're just not going to build new prisons um and then hearing those sorts of things are really fantastic and seeing you know walking into a prison in the Netherlands and seeing internet access and people who are about to be released being able to look on the internet and you know supervised but be able to you know um you know use the internet to to plan their life and release and the world hasn't sort of you know collapsed as, as a result and so you know that's going to be the discussion on our panel discussion later and obviously you both take a kind of a global approach to your work on on criminal justice and i just wanted to get your thoughts on why you think it's important you know for yourselves and for the cja and our members to be aware of and, and involved what happens you know sort of internationally and you know where in the world you think we should be looking for inspiration and and sort of promising approaches when we're doing this kind of rethinking redesigning of our criminal justice systems do you want me to go first um i think the really really obvious place to talk about is norway and i know Raphael, you've been inside halden i think you did you did your your time in halden and i went and visited there and and this is kind of you know held up as um, a really rehabilitative prison and I think it's talked about so often um, that I kind of wanted to actually highlight what I saw when I went to America and when I went to work in Chicago, because I went there thinking this is going to be terrible. America is going to be absolutely awful. We have nothing to learn. And I think I kind of went to use it um, in my research as this like um, opposite against Norway and then Britain would be somewhere in the middle. And actually I went to visit like community services in Chicago where instead of sending people on to custodial sentences people were on electronic tag in a halfway house where they were expected to go to therapy sessions each day and the residents there worked running a food bank for the local community every day they prepared all the food they got it out they they dealt with the local community and this was in chicago and this is where we we often think the criminal justice system is just completely wrong but they were for short sentences, people were doing their sentences in the community and they were actively engaging with the community as part of that sentence. And I just think we have so much to learn from that when we know that short sentences don't work. Um, when we can see Chicago doing this, this is something we can learn from places around the world that maybe we didn't expect to in the first place. And then my second um, place where I think we have just so much to learn from is how Portugal is de decriminalizing drugs and the effects on HIV, hepatitis C, the effects on um, incarceration there and the effects on um, the health system there yes. are just huge from this decriminalization of drugs. So I know that I always, always talk about Thank Norway. So I wanted to mention a couple of different places today as well, just to kind of give the rest of the world a, a shout out too, I think. I think I think for me, uh, um, and, and it's interesting you say that we can learn a lot from what you've seen, yeah, Angie, sure. in Chicago and Norway. Yeah, I have. Sorry, I think someone's just off mute again. If, if everyone could just mute, that'd be great. Thank you. Been to Howden. I think I've been to a prison at, um, in my recent Netflix series in Cyprus. I think it just pips. Okay. How they're not aesthetically, but in Cyprus and Nicosia, I, I, I witnessed um, things in that prison that I'd never witnessed before. And I would encourage lots of people to watch that show um, or even go to that prison. Yeah. And it's not because of the structure of the prison. It's because of its leadership. And it does come down to leadership. We here in the UK and the practices, you know, Criminal Justice Alliance members and the work that they do, have a wealth of insight and information that they can take into many of the places that I've been to around the world and, and witnessed. Um, as much as we can learn from, from some of these places. And for example, I remember going to Belize and being in the prison system, the criminal justice system there, and I was really kind of surprised by what I was witnessing in terms of what was going on in the prison, in terms of how they administer punishment to those that they believed had 
um, in, in, you know, broken the rules. And I was really saddened by what I'd witnessed and what I'd experienced. But it also made me think, hold on, the way we punished individuals in prisons here in the United Kingdom or how we send people to prison and then punish them, um, we ain't doing as bad as they're doing in Belize. And so we can take those understandings from here and maybe inform those over there. And I get asked a lot by prison guards and people who work in the prison establishments in many of the countries I've been to, oh really, do you have NGOs or charities coming to the prison and work with the prisons? And I'm like, don't you have them going on here? And they say no. And that really surprises me because I was under the impression, and I suppose most people are, that you know, globally, charities and NGOs work inside prisons, uh, uh, you know, whether it's providing rehabilitation programs or other resources, educational resources, et cetera. But there are a lot of places where these don't take place at all, zero. I mean, zero communication with the outside world. Paraguay, for example, is another place where they hardly have any NGOs or charities working outside in the community trying to address the issue of drugs, for example, um, substance abuse or, or even trafficking and dealing, um, let alone inside the prison where there is absolutely zero. And so I think we can take a lot of what is done just here in the UK or across Europe into these places. And I think they would welcome it. And that's one of the reasons I have set up the foundation because I want to bridge that gap and try and work with organizations who would be prepared to, to offer those kind of services. Um, so I think there is a lot we can, we can, we can learn and we can share with these um, you know, criminal justice systems in other places. And then there's the alternative kind of justice systems, you know, and, and, and alternative routes of punishment that they use, because they do, and I was surprised by this, and I say this because, you know, I spent time in British prisons, I thought they were terrible and they were bad, and they are, and people experience prison differently, those who are prisoners, those who work in the prisons, those who visit the prisons, those who, you know, try and implement programs and education, so everybody experiences prison, um, their experience of prison is going to be very different, so I took that kind of view into my work as I started to go around the globe, but realized very, very quickly that every culture and every prison and every criminal justice system is very different and they do things differently. The only thing that is similar is people get arrested, they get charged, they get convicted and they go to prison. But beyond that, everything can be very differently. So there is a lot that we can learn and they can learn from us if only we were able to redirect our resources to share that information. I, I, I really think that for sure. It was fascinating actually, and it reminded me of something, Raphael, you said um, when we were in Utrecht in the Netherlands, and we were talking about families and how people support families of people in prison. And they said, oh, we came to the UK to park prison and yeah. looked at the work that was going on here. And now we've scaled that up across, you know, um, you know most of the, their prisons. And it was a bit embarrassing then to have to say, actually, you know, even though there are pockets of good practice around working with with families in the UK, and there are some, you know, some really good, good, good work, it actually hasn't, you know, it's not embedded, you know, as a run of the mill thing across all of our prisons. And actually, they've taken some good practices and they've gone further than actually we have that originated with that good practice, which is, you know, is really frustrating, actually, that. You know, we've got such good practice over here, but, you know, how do we scale it up here as well? But I, and, and what you were saying, Angela, just reminded me of when I was in the States and I thought the same thing, actually, when I went to the States, it's part of the Churchill Fellowship. You know, you don't think you go there to look for good practice. But I mean, I just remember being in a prison in California up until about 10 o'clock at night and it was buzzing with you know, um, university lectures with um, dog training, with choirs, with all sorts of different, you know, programs going on late into the evening. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't believe it because I'm having worked in prisons, you know. 4.30 and yeah. everyone's, yeah, everyone's, and everyone's out. Like, yeah. Believe and I said, this is, cr I said, this is kind of crazy. And they said, no, you're crazy in your country because actually, you know, this is when people that are working full time, they can come in and they volunteer their expertise, their services, you know, um, free of charge to, you know, get access to some of the top experts and people, you know, mm -hmm. people in the community can then come in and provide those opportunities for people that they couldn't do during the day. So that's why we have a whole plethora of evening activities to give people lots of different opportunities to experience things and connect in with the local community and the community to come in 
and experience that as well, you know, so that their perceptions are changed. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it was, it's funny that you don't think you go to learn good things, but actually, definitely, definitely. But also, I suppose, um, Norway can teach us kind of how to run a rehabilitative prison. But I think what I think is really important for like members of the CJA to remember, like people who care about this course is that Norway wasn't always like this. And I think the biggest learning I had from Norway is that they used to have a worse recidivism rate than us. They were very like revenge focused and they it was a movement. It was a ground up movement of people who had lived experience of having been in prison, plus prisoners, families, plus charity organizations, along with a movement from the top and a policy level that enacted that change. And when people say, you know, can we do it in the UK? I think that Norway is most inspiring because it has changed from a revenge based system towards this system. Um, and it's changed because people at the bottom and people at the top all were working towards the same goal. So I think it's quite it gives me optimism and hope. And I hope that it gives kind of members who are, you know, still tirelessly working away in the sector hope that change can come too. So I'm going to stop us at that point. There was um, there's more on that fantastic uh, discussion that I had with uh, with Raphael and Angela, which we'll be uh, sharing afterwards, so you can yeah continue to hear the the rest of the discussion. But thank you, Angela um, and Raphael, for, for their time and their their insights. Um, I'm going to pass on now to our panel uh, that we've got. Um, and I'm going to introduce, first of all, uh, Jana um, from Rubicon Centrum in the Czech Republic, um, that we were recently there in the summer. Um, and I'm going to invite her and also um, hi to Marek, her, her colleague, who's here as well. Um, and I'm going to just share my uh, screen and share, share slides for you, Jana. So if you want to unmute yourself, Jana, I'll just get those slides up for you. Thank you. And good good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Nina, for inviting me and having the chance to share uh, maybe some good practice uh, from a surprising place, which is the uh, Czech Republic. <laughs> As Nina mentioned, to one of the countries that was involved in the joint project on system change in criminal justice. And always when you want to push for a system change, it's important that you need to work on different levels. Of course, you have to do, you know, advocacy work, work with politicians, but it's also important to have some public support for your cause. And that's why it's also important to work with, with public and to raise awareness and change the attitudes of people like we heard in the, in the previous session. And what I wanted to share with you are some examples of how we do that and what we think works well uh, to, win the hearts of the people and change their uh, prejudice towards people with, with criminal past. One of the examples I'm going to start with uh, is the community center and garden that we have in Prague. And uh, it's a kind of a natural place where the different worlds can meet. So it's a place where the people from the local community can come. As you can see, there's, uh, there's also a lot of children coming. And you know, if you move to the next slide yeah so uh, it's a place where really the people living in the neighborhood come they come with their uh, children with their families and at the same time they know it's a place where uh, they can meet people with history of incarceration because we don't hide this fact on the contrary we want the garden to be a place where these different worlds meet so we organize events where both the local community, but also our clients and their families can come and spend their free time. Uh, we can move to the next slide. <laughs> uh, so we have all kinds of nice activities uh, in the garden. And we were really surprised mainly that uh, actually the main group from the local community coming are people uh, with children and nobody's worried and afraid, you know, that you go to a place where you can meet criminals, I'm, I'm, I'm doing like that. Uh, so it's a very good way to, to mix up uh, the different worlds. Uh, what we also do is that we have uh, training jobs uh, in the garden. Uh, we can, yeah, thanks, Nina. So we have really people who have just been released from prison who uh, can work there for a half a year. 
uh, to gain some uh, skills, you know, which will make them able to continue to the regular labor market. So that's another role of the garden. And of course, uh, we can move further. Uh, there's also activities inside, both for uh, the people with criminal past, but also for public. Uh, it's also space that can be rented to other NGOs organizing their own events or companies who often do their team buildings in our garden. Uh, so that's another way how to attract people to the topic. Yeah, we can move on. Um, and the last uh, pictures really show that it's really a garden. So you can, you know, rent a little piece of land and grow your veggies and, and, and stuff. And we're happy that uh, this example inspired our colleagues from Slovakia, who were also a members of our international team. And they actually started their own a community garden recently uh, as well. So this, this idea is, is spreading up, which is, which is nice. Uh, yeah, we can we can move on, you know, I think, yeah, that's it. There's some pictures from the garden. Uh, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, and another uh, uh, way how we want to work uh, or we do work with, with public uh, and mainly also with companies in our country is organizing a big sport event. Uh, it's a, a relay race uh, called Yellow Ribbon Run. And the idea is not ours originally, it comes from Singapore. So again, we got inspired somewhere else. And I will show you a short video from the last year of Yellow Ribbon Run. And actually, I have some people here that actually participated as runners. Uh, the nice thing uh, is that during the run, everybody's wearing, you know, the same clothes and it's a relay, a relay race. So uh, you will have to have teams. Uh, so there's really like beautiful mixture of uh, even people who are still uh, serving their term in prison, but they can come and participate this one day. You have their families, you have NGOs working in the field, a lot of people from the prison service and the probation uh, service who are our actually partners. We organize this event together. And it's again a positive way how to change uh, the attitudes of people uh, of general public towards people with criminal past and the main slogan is uh, run away from prejudice and it's about giving second chances so i will ask nina just to show you quickly the video because it's better than talking English subtitles, yeah. <laughs> Šanci postavit se na nohy, vrátit se do společnosti a užívat si svobody. Každý má přece na druhou šanci nárok, protože žlutá služka a tenhle ten závod. Tohle není návod na to, jak máš žít. Pamatuj, že všechno může změnit. Stačí Když vím, že zvládneme životní zvon. Problémy přejdeme, přejdeme. jak chce za Rubikon. Rubikon. Stačí se svých šancí chopit. Věřím, že zvládneme životní 
Tak my vás tady s paní Plukovníkovou zmeme na osmý ročník Yellow Ribbon Run a zase doufejme, že tady. A ten ročník věnujeme ženám. Takovému jinému, že jo? Přesně. <laughs> Čímy jační a podaný ruce, spolky, který dávají naději věznu v republice. Běžet za správnou věc, svobodu a šanci, dostat dobrou práci těm, kterým se říká psanci. Řekni, kolik lidí se do vězení vrací, po popuštění páchají, až nedostanou práci. Pak začnou krást a tomu brát drogy. Není to hobby, je to doma pro nás. Okay, so uh, this was from last year, which was dedicated to the topic of uh, children with incarcerated parents. And next year will be dedicated to women, as you heard. I'm inviting you all to, to come and join uh, us in Prague. And the last topic that I'm just really briefly uh, will touch is that it's also important uh, when you push for system changes in criminal justice to involve people with lived experience, as you will discuss later. And then we have just started, uh, actually next week, we have a intensive uh, training program uh, in Ostrava, which is another city in Prague, for a small group of people with lived experience, who after the course, some of them will join us, you know, in our advocacy work, uh, because those who, who know the criminal justice system from inside should be part of the dialogue when we push for reforms of prison system and criminal justice system as such. So we just started uh, this pro project called uh, Our Voice Matters and uh, the experience of Criminal Justice Alliance and the Elevate program was inspiring for us as well because we were starting around the same time with, with, with our project. So definitely uh, there was a lot and still will be a lot of inspiration for us as well. So that's uh, that's the last comment from me. I hope I haven't spent too much uh, of my time. And um, I also have to apologize if you have any questions, uh, my colleague Marek will answer because I'm leaving for a restorative program that I'm participating, participating at in, in one of the prisons near Prague. So I have to leave shortly, sorry. Thank you so much, Jana. We really, yeah, that was bringing back really good memories of of the run and um, spending time in the community gardens um, and just to let CGI members know that we're um, as you may have seen in our new strategy we've committed to um, trying to bring the yellow ribbon run here um, in England and Wales and we've had some good discussions um, I think someone from the Alliance of Sport is on this call who, and we've been talking about that um, and we've got a funding application in at the moment so keeping our fingers crossed for uh, being able to bring that um, over here but no we were really inspired um, by those examples of good practice so yeah thank you Jana and, and Marek and, and Lenka. Um, I'm going to pass on now to Veronique um, who's from Restorative Justice Netherlands um, and I'm going to ask you Veronique if that's okay to speak about your work in Restorative Justice Netherlands and also to speak a little about Rescaled. We were due to have Hans Klaus join us um, today but um, there's a strike in Belgian prisons today so he's having to deal with, with that but he's recorded a, a piece for us uh, which we're going to put on our YouTube uh, channel to talk about Rescaled um, but I wondered if Veronique if you could do a bit of an introduction and then uh, members can go and listen to that afterwards. I'm going to pass on to, on to Veronique. Yeah definitely uh, I can do that. So I made a PowerPoint, but I don't know if people are want to see a PowerPoint or just uh, have me talk. I can do both. Um, so shall I start with Restorative Justice Netherlands? If I can just, uh, we'll just share my screen. I think I just need to make you a host, Veronique. Oh, no, you can do it. I think I'm, I'm host Perfect. already. Excellent. Uh, so thanks. Uh, good work. So thank you for inviting me, first of all. That's, um, that's great. Thank you, Nina. And um, it's good to hear the, all the, the, the yeah, Jana is, is, is here as well, um, as we have been part of Together for Systemic Change in, in Prague a lot, and we've been traveling. And um, so Nina asked me to talk about restorative justice and, and also mainly uh, about restorative cities and restorative societies. So I don't know how much people know already about restorative justice, um, but I will tell about restorative justice Netherlands now. So we 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 found it uh, about twelve years ago, 
and the co-founders uh, Anneke, uh, Anneke van Hoek and Gertjan Slump, they were inspired by experiences abroad. Uh, so like we are sharing today our experience, but they were uh, inspired by restorative justice. And the name of our organization is restorative justice. So it's an English term and we chose not to have the Dutch translation because that's very different, uh, very different connotation. Um, so we have a, uh, an English uh, name, but uh, it evolved. Like you see in this image, it's it says uh, a restorative city transforming societies into communities. And I think that's one of the reasons is that what the co-founders did in the past 10 years is focusing a lot on uh, offender victim uh, society. It's this, this triangle in restorative justice, but in practice, it's it's is a lot. It's often reduced to victim offender uh, talks, and where we all we all support, of course, um, restorative practices and healing in this way. We also acknowledge that this is not the only thing that needs to be done when we're looking at uh, society and, and, and reducing crime or reducing or doing, um, re, what, what's the word? We're trying to do, do the right thing, but we also have the responsibility to undo the wrong thing. And I think that's also where our work comes in now. And for example, uh, I heard before in the talk, it was said uh, the focus was very much second chance. Um, whereas I think a lot of people in society never had a fair first chance. So for me, I think it's always painful when we talk about uh, second chance and we, 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 we feel like it's, I mean, it was a great presentation, so don't. Uh, it was great to hear, but I think we also need to acknowledge that some people haven't even got a fair first chance. So then it's really weird to keep talking about, oh, you need a second chance. If you haven't got the first chance, don't say things like that. That's hurtful, I think. Um, so I think we had in the couple in the past couple of years, we had a lot of talks like this and also a few scandals um, in the Netherlands uh, with the tax service agency that uh, put thousands of people with a non-Dutch name on a blacklist and they they just said to people like to thousands of people 30 40,000 even more like okay we think you're trying to steal money from us so you you get a you you have to pay it back um, because you're lying where in fact they weren't lying so um and, and actually, the, some of these people, a small number of people got into huge debt because of it. They had to borrow money. And then uh, some of them even uh, ended up in prison because they couldn't pay their, their, their debt. So this is very wrong. This is something going wrong in society and in systems. And, um, and I think we've, when we, when, I don't know, everyone here is very much aware about their prison system. And I've traveled a lot in Europe in a lot of um, prisons and, and, and read about different countries. And what I always see is that the larger part of the people in prison is also one of the largest population um, of, I don't know the, what the correct word in English is, but it's the, because I hate this word, what I'm about to say, but the minority groups, the groups that are, that came from different countries that are part of your society, and that is one of the largest group in prison and or uh, poverty has a, a lot to do. So we know all these things. So it's actually we see people not connecting well to society for different reasons, but we blame them for not be becoming part of society. So in my, of course, I put it more simple than it is, because in reality, things do go wrong. But overall, there's there's a lot of steps to take. And. So we are shifting focus from, okay, you are the offender, you are the victim, let's talk, from, okay, what is going on here? Why did it happen with you, the offender, with maybe, with everyone involved? And instead of talking about victim, offender, we're talking about people involved in the process. So personally, I never use the words victim, offender anymore. 
only to say it now to explain um, what is happening, but never in any presentations. Um, I just talk about people involved in the process. And, and we would like to see the justice system turn into that as well. Um, okay, so this is the, so restorative justice Netherlands, it's now um, about 12 years. And I think we made a lot of, we made some good steps when it comes to the victim offender talks um, in prison, because each prison now has to have a, a restorative plan for each person, even though they don't do it yet, but it's the idea they need to do it. So policymakers are, are on board in that sense. Um, I will skip this. So I think one of the, um, one of the things that we're working on now is, is a project, it's called uh, the principle of inequality. The principle of equality is very important in our justice system, whereas at the same time, it's not fair because this is exactly why the, the, the fair first chance is preventing us from doing justice. And I think when you look at this map, it, it's in Dutch, but on the right side or sorry, left side, I'm very bad in left and right. And supposedly it's a real thing. So don't judge me for it, that I'm stupid. It's just something in mainly the female brain. So sorry. Uh, so on the left side, um, you see uh, where the, 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 the offenders come from. It's the map of Amsterdam. So the red is where the, the main, where the most offenders come from. And then the right side you see in the darkest red is, also, is where the uh, highest level of poverty is. So you see the extreme high correlation between poverty and, and crime. And we know this for years already. Um, in the US, they had, they had this huge, um, you know, it's uh, Nina, this million dollar blocks. Million where, dollar hoods, yeah. yeah. Yeah, million dollar, I think, uh, blocks or hoods where they saw like, okay, there are millions, like a lot of people of this block go into the prison system. Why not support them? in advance and then they did research and um so it's i think it's this thinking that that we are part of what is happening in society and it's very difficult to feel responsible when something in a na another neighborhood is happening and at the same time yeah you know processes like this happen so how to take your responsibility um so what we did is the project of principle of inequality so I'm saying this because these are examples of the restorative city we are thinking about. So this is uh, the project principle of inequality is about showing that you have this number of uh, young adults between 18 years and 30 who are sentenced for six months um, to prison. And what we're trying to do is look at their history which neighborhoods are they uh, coming from so again the map before so if they are, are coming from the red neighborhoods what is going what went wrong 30 years ago like why didn't policymakers do anything about it or did they make it worse or if they knew a school was uh, was doing very poorly why did they allow children to be sent to that school over and over again and maybe these youngsters um come from from specific schools or specific neighborhoods maybe so and then retaking uh, responsibility when a youngster like that is at the courthouse that the, the judge would not only say okay you youngster have done something wrong but also saying you municipality there's something going wrong because this is the 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 fifth year in a row that we see youngsters from this neighborhood from this school so what is going on in society so you have to take your responsibility at this point now and within one year we want to see it differently of course we're not there yet but this is a wish that that this is at least a way for us society and the justice system to take their responsibility as well and not only putting their blame on an individual, but also putting responsibility on societal uh, systems. So yeah, this is, uh, so we, this is the woman. So Lady Justice is not blind, guys. She's not. So don't say it ever again. 
Um, so a second project we're working on, or it's actually a movement, it's reskilled. And reskilled is a clear concept. It's about small scale detention houses, but maybe Hans will tell about more about it in the video. So I will just say it from a restorative city and restorative society perspective. So what we do is not only, um, I mean, so the not to, not to, uh, I mean, I liked the presentation before, but I heard Norway as an example again. I think we need to be aware that they are one of the richest countries in Europe, that they not only have a vision on criminal justice, but they have a different vision on society. So, and it's interesting that a lot of countries look at them, but only take this little part of how to change the criminal justice system, but that won't ever work, even, even if you do exactly the same as them, because they have a broader vision on on, on society, so better healthcare, better housing. So it's I think it's very important to be aware of, of that, that you need to have a vision on society before you try to change anything in the criminal justice system. So for us, uh, reskilled detention houses is not, not something we want to replicate. And we don't want countries to replicate exactly what we are doing or what Belgium is doing. But to really redefine the concept within your own national con context. And one of the things we are aiming for now within a project, this the Wish EU project. I will go, yeah, this one. The Wish EU is working in small scale detention houses. Um, that's what Wish stands for. And we're trying to define European rules on small scale detention houses on the European Union level. Um, so the Council of Europe that's not the European Union, the Council of Europe defined the European prison rules and all EU countries are trying to abide by it. They don't, but they try in an informal way. And we're trying to create a different paradigm that countries can also abide by. So you can choose maybe in the future. So I don't want prisons anymore, but we do want to have rules for small scale detention houses. So it's top down, um, but we hope to stimulate it bottom up that, that countries develop their own concept, but also have these rules. And we have the learning labs on different topics. So Nina and Jamie were kind enough to talk about uh, work and different ideas that, uh, that are, are in the UK. So we will have speakers from all over Europe, um, not only European Union guys, so all over Europe. Uh, so you're all welcome to join. Uh, if you want, you can send me or email, uh, Nina an email. So this is also really trying to change the system instead of improving, trying to improve individuals. It's a difference. And I think from a restorative justice perspective, we're trying to improve individuals and their well-being and their, but now it's really much on a systemic level and that's a different focus. Um, yeah, I will keep it short. So basically what I feel is that countries have a lot in common. Uh, of course, we have, we do different projects, but overall we have similar issues, similar, yeah, things we're trying to change. So it's really helpful to have exchanges like this. And also from the Together for Systemic Change uh, partners, this was great to hear and to see. Um, yeah, and I think I basically said restorative justice is not necessarily improving uh, systemic problems, but so the vision from restorative justice needs to be aligned with restorative city and restorative society. So on an individual level, on an organizational level and a societal level. Um, yeah, and just uh, keep inspiring each other. That was it for me. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Veronique. That's wonderful. And um, yeah, it's really interesting what you were saying about the um, second chances, because this is something we've been talking about at CJA, because we've been involved in some work that Frameworks have been doing, one of our member organisations, Frameworks UK, and they've just published some research we spoke about at the, at the uh, work workshop yesterday. Um, and one of their recommendations, actually, in that research is about not using that term second chances, actually. And um, so that's really interesting that you, you picked up on that. 
Um, and I love the fact that you were talking about each prison having a restorative plan, something that the CJA has been pushing for, for the last two or three years is about having a national action plan for restorative justice. Um, and there has been some pushback on that, but we've got a victims bill coming up and I know lots of our members and others are, are pushing to um, ensure that they have a, a strategy around restorative justice, but also restorative approaches. Um, and we've got some members working in that kind of restorative practice area and communities. Um, so yeah, I really love what you were saying about, you know, thinking about this, not just in terms of two individuals, but everyone impacted. Um, and also you know, the society as well. And I, and I love the fact that when we went to the Netherlands, um, it's the probation and mediation service rather than just the probation service. So it really sort of shows that embedding of this concept around mediation and restorative justice as well. So that's uh, something I took away. But thank you so much for that. And, and as I said, we'll be posting Hans's uh, more detail about the uh, rescaled project for, for people to listen to. Um, so I'll pass thank back you. over to... Uh, Thanks, Veronique. I'll pass back over to Kevin uh, for the chairing of the conversation. Okay, thanks for that, Nina, and thanks so much, Veronique, and also to uh, Jana, who I think has has now um, has has unfortunately had to leave. Um, so I guess, folks, it's an opportunity just to um, to ask any questions uh, in relation to the input we've had so far. Uh, also, if you have any comments you'd like to make. Uh, and indeed, perhaps to uh, share any thoughts or ideas you have um, around learning that you've managed to kind of accrue from working with other countries and whichever countries it might be, then this is this is the uh, opportunity to do that. So I, I guess, first of all, do we have any, I'm just looking at the chat, do we have any kind of questions perhaps for Veronique uh, or for, I think, Jana's colleague? Uh, all chat. Um, okay, I don't think we have any, any particular questions at the moment. Um, so I wonder what, whether colleagues have any particular experiences they might wish to talk about in relation to um, learning from uh, other countries or internationally. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, Maria is in the room somewhere. Uh, I don't know if Maria, you had something you might want to share with us. Maria. Right. Ah, there you are. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just in a, in an office. Hold on. I'll see. Sorry, I was just in a really noisy office. No, that's all right. Noisy, Thanks, Maria. Noisy colleagues, noisy colleagues at St. Giles. It's always, <laughs> it's always lively. Um, well, I mean, I did back in the day before Brexit, we were involved in quite a few um, European projects, which was great, you know, when there was funding streams. I mean, everyone was an amazing experience. And, you know, the opportunities that that gave us as an organisation to learn from each other was really important. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd say I've just written down a few key learning points. Um, sure. For for me, I suppose what I felt that you know quite a few of these trips were with our Ministry of Justice, and I did feel like there was a kind of arrogance almost from the British that you know our systems were somehow superior, maybe. Right. And um, you know that certainly wasn't the case. They were different, but they weren't better. And one thing that really impressed me, especially in Italy and Greece and uh, Portugal, was how important the family is and how seeing your family was a right, not a privilege. Whereas in our prisons, I just think it's totally shocking that you have to be, um, you know, well behaved to get family visits. You know, in Portugal, they see you last see your family whenever you wanted every day if you wanted so in terms of resettlement you know obviously that's massively important and um, the other thing I thought was really interesting was food you know that food obviously it's Italy food's bound to be important I suppose but um you know like in Italy yeah the, the food the prisoners got was really good you know I, I would have eaten it in an Italian restaurant and in the open prison they got wine with their meal <laughs> 
Right. Which I thought was very civilised. You know, like in Portugal, there were real coffee machines on every landing. Right. You know, so just little things like that. Um, the things that I thought weren't so good, there was a lot of conflict around um, integration versus diversity. But okay. we really felt our prisons were about diversity and about promoting um, diverse groups. So like in Wandsworth Prison, there was a Jamaican group, there was an Irish group, there was a Latin American group, whereas like, uh, we did do some work with the French as well. You know, France and Belgium, where if you were imprisoned in those countries, you were French or you were Belgium. You know, you couldn't, you, you, you couldn't kind of um, promote your own your own culture um and the same in Italy it's a bit like everybody was Catholic which was kind of a bit weird and um I suppose there was you know I did encounter some real racism not personally but like we worked with the Roma project in Hungary and uh, the level of um discrimination against Roma people was uh, quite you know really upsetting so I think that's all I'm sorry for the background noise <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's absolutely fine, Maria. Thank, thanks for thanks for your input there. Um, so I'm going to go to I think Carlotta. I don't know if Carlotta's here. Uh, you might have something to possibly contribute to this, Carlotta. Uh, okay. She had a comment in the chat, but okay. Um. Maybe Neve wanted to come in. I think she wanted to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Neve. I think if you're, you're commenting, I think, on on, on uh, Angela's book, Neve. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Angela. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet Hi. you. Um, I really um, enjoyed your book, Angela. I thought it was uh, really moving. Um, it was recommended to me by a man who had been in prison himself and had experience of care, who I work with um, currently. He told me to read it. He said it was um, really important. And it was. Um, so thank you. Um, I am, I currently work on a project with um, care experienced young men um, serving sentences in the West Midlands. But before that, I was a prison officer at uh, Aylesbury, which is a young offenders institute for those who aren't in the UK for 18 to 21 year olds. Um, one of the big things that really um, hit me in your book, Angela, was the sort of when you went to Norway and the support available to the staff who were there, the counselling that they would get, whether they needed it or not, on quite a regular basis. And it was, um, I think you definitely just said it in your book, but it was really, um, it almost made me laugh um, at how much support they were getting when I thought about the absolute lack of support that staff get here, um, even though the violence that they experience or see can often be a lot worse. Um, and it's also interesting to sort of think about how that violence and that um, in the impact of that job can, instead of bringing um, together the people who are suffering from the effect of prison, which are which can be the staff and the people in prison itself, it instead turns them in on each other and it can become a really bad us versus them culture and people can start blaming each other instead of thinking about how the system is poorly affecting everyone um, in the set in a different but you know harmful way. So I was, I was wondering when I was reading, I was like, do we think that support is ever going to be um, available here? Do we ever think that that kind of thing? Um, what are going to be a case I could see people shaking heads um, but also um, do you th do we think it would ever be the case that it would be understood that that support wouldn't just help the staff which would almost you know be seen as something that is important but would also be important and supportive for the people in prison as well as they would benefit from staff who had proper counselling proper support in their jobs um, I had another point that I was typing up, but I could pause there if that's helpful. Thanks, thanks Neve. Uh, Angela, do you want to maybe comment on that? Yeah, um, so I took part recently in a research project with the University of Manchester. <clears throat> and as part of this research project, there was me who's come in from kind of the civilian side of things, but we also had prison governors and POA um, members and leaders. and. We were asked this question, we were asked, how do we support staff in prison? Um, and I think there are two answers. There's the answer where what we should be doing. Um, and, and it's absolutely kind of, we should be providing, you know, real intensive support for the staff. But we had a real conversation around what can we do now? 
And I was really heartened to hear the governors, the POA, kind of everyone from all sides of prison life, other than the people experiencing living in there, um, but everyone talking about the need for creating safe spaces within the prison for decompression, the need for um, providing support and supervision. And we were trying to work out what can we do now or what could we do tomorrow without any extra money, without any extra facilities. And the, the governors involved in this call were kind of saying there are ways of doing this. We do clear out. We can clear out a room in the prison that's away from the wings where people are um, allowed, staff are allowed to go there and ask for support. Um, so I, it, it sounds quite basic to just say, we'll give people a staff room with a cup of tea and, and the time to decompress. But actually, we don't even have that um, in reality in a lot of prisons. So I think even talking about that was just such a step forward. And I felt quite optimistic knowing that this is something I think governors and the POA really do think is important in the same way that perhaps we who are trained more in the idea of mental health and looking after one's own well-being, maybe we're kind of converted to that idea already. But there was this real roundtable discussion where governors are trying to push for that within their individual establishments without asking for any additional budget to do so from the government. That's really good to hear. I Before I left, that room was created in Aylesbury. I don't know if it's still there. Um, but it it was um, it was really great to see that there was like a space being made um, just to like with some comfy chairs um, which were hard to come by um, in prison and, and a toasty machine um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um, the other thing I wanted to say quickly and it was actually something that I thought about when listening to um, Veronique um, which was really interesting as well sort of like you know how the prisons are only one part of society they're only one aspect of the whole society and the work I'm doing right now is uh, we are trying to bring together um, the people who work with care experienced young men while they're in prison so their prison offender managers their probation officers but also their personal advisors from the local authority um, and bring them all together so they can work as a team to support the young person which sounds um, fairly straightforward, but you would be surprised to see how confusing that some people find it and also just the, the way that the systems are laid out. There's no overlapping, there's no connection between them all. So we're building those connection lines between one another. And I suppose it's um, a question to everyone of sort of how do you improve one section of the prison, one section of society, aka prisons, when while acknowledging that that's not every, that's not the entirety, and also knowing that there are so many different branches out and in to prison from local authorities, from councils, from probation, that the people who are in that prison are going to have to connect with. And even if one section is improving, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person's life as a whole is, you know, getting easier when they have other um, sectors and practitioners that they've got to work with. Okay, th thanks very much for, the, for your question and comments and also Angela for your, your response to that. I wonder if um, possibly we can go to Lorraine. I mean, Lorraine, you've posted something in the chat. I just wonder whether you want to elaborate on that. You were talking about that perhaps transference of practice from uh, elsewhere to different contexts, Lorraine. Oh, I, uh, I, 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 I think you, you're still on Sorry. mute, Lorraine. There you go. Okay, so this was an earlier discussion, although I was very much enjoying what I just listened to. But yeah. so when working in India and in southern Denmark, you know, which had outputs that could be transferred, um, you know, translating them into another language wasn't enough. The cultural customs need to be understood. And so to work together, there needs to be a, a cultural translation process, in my opinion, particularly with design, because context is everything and things don't simply transfer. And it's known in international design very clearly that, you know, context is everything. So it strikes me in terms of criminal justice, we should build on those learnings. And certainly from the projects I've worked on, you know, like the game that was developed in um, southern Denmark, which is now in use in every prison, didn't work in UK prisons because of all sorts of reasons I won't go into now. And ditto, the translation from English into Hindi wasn't enough. The imagery, the cultural customs, 
that made that app, we actually won, a, won an award for that project. We won a British um, Council Award because we did actually translate the cultural customs and it did work, but it took some time. It wasn't just take one thing, plonk it somewhere else. That doesn't work. And most designers know that. So that, that was the point I was making about any system, particularly a restorative justice system. It would need very context specific implication and work. So that's, that's all I was saying. Okay, thanks a lot, Lorraine. Uh, Angela, I wonder if we can pop, pop back to you. And, and I don't know if there's anything from perhaps the, the, the talk that Yana gave a little bit earlier, and also I think what Veronique was talking about in relation to restorative justice and also um, the, you know, the, the detention houses work, that you had any thoughts on that or, or some, uh, some commentary on that? Um, I think... I think everything I've heard is I'm I'm kind of in in total agreement, and I I find it um, difficult sometimes when people ask me, you know, the the one soundbite question of so what should we do about prisons? Mm. Um, because because any we have so many problems in society, and prison kind of magnifies those. So we see we see poverty, we see you know the socioeconomic circumstances of people, we see the systemic racism. We see all these things kind of reflected and refracted inside prison. So I think the thing that I, I have seen done incredibly well, and I suppose this is what you're talking about with, with the Italian prison system over here, um, is that this link between community and prison is something that um, really, really works. Um, this idea that there isn't uh, a, a separation of um, what's going on behind the walls and what what isn't going on behind um, and what's going on in society, and I think this allows us to have a greater understanding that community problems are prison problems and prison problems are community problems too. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there really needs to be. Maybe a put, I've kind of said um, in the past, a push for if you care about any problems in society, if you care about the systemic racism in society, if you care about the way we treat veterans and homeless people, if any of these kind of social justice issues you care about in society, that thing is happening in prison. And I think perhaps that's a way that we can, we can get people on board with uh, a prison reform agenda is when we explain that something that they care about in the community, some cause they care about, is, is probably happening in prison and is probably happening in a worse way. So I suppose that's me kind of just rambling about the, the connection between community and custody and, and agreeing with, with the points um, around restorative justice, around the fact that, um, that we need to be more integrated in what we do. Yeah, I, that, that's my, my primary thoughts on, on all of that. No, 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 that's really helpful. I think it is. It, it it bears repeating. I think about that that issue of connecting, um, you know, uh, prisons with with uh, communities and local communities, uh, and something we should never uh, really lose, lose sight of. So I'm just having a look at the chat. I don't know whether we we have any kind of further comments or questions at this point on the inputs we've had thus far, um, because I'm thinking that we could always come back to it a little bit later if need be. Um, so what I'm minded to do really is to move us to uh, the, the kind of formal business really of, of today's meeting, which is the, the annual general meeting uh, that, that uh, is the CJA's annual general meeting. So if we could perhaps um, move to that. Um, and I, I guess there are, there are probably, let me see, uh, four parts to that really. So I'll just kind of outline them now. The first part is to uh, for the, the meeting of the members to uh, formally approve the minutes of the last um, uh, AGM, which we had last year. We also then uh, need to uh, approve the annual report uh, and accounts. Um, we also have, um, we have, we have this sort of uh, annual cycle, um, which is determined by our memorandum and articles around uh, a certain number of trustees who are currently on the board uh, resigning and then also potentially being reappointed as well. So we have that uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do. And then we have uh, a director's update uh, 
as, as part and parcel of all this. Okay, so if I can move to the the first formal item then, which is to do with the uh, the minutes of the uh, the last uh, annual general meeting, which uh, has been circulated, I understand, to to all members. Uh, so everyone should have had that uh, in advance of today's meeting. Um, and I, I guess really it's just to invite any or to ask for any kind of comments on that um, at all uh, and any questions on that. Um, so I'll just pause there for a moment in case anyone does have any questions about the annual general minute, AGM minutes from last year. Um, I'm just checking across the various screens I've got just to make sure if we have anything. So I don't think we have any uh, any questions or comments raised. So in order to, to approve the minutes, can I ask uh, CJA members to virtually raise your hands, please? Um, so hopefully you're, you're fairly, used. well, you could, yeah, you can do it virtually or you can just stick your hands up in the air. That'd be great. We'll just do a quick uh, count. So if you are a CJA member, can you put your, uh, Either, either do a virtual thing or put your uh, your screen back on so we can see the show of hands uh, and so that my colleagues, uh, perhaps Hannah, or can just do a quick check to make sure that we've. So I think we have a. For what I can tell, based on that helpful show of hands in different forms, that uh, the, the the minutes are approved. Okay, can I take that as being the case? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, on to the next uh, formal item then, which is about the uh, annual report and accounts. So I'm going to ask uh, Carol, our, our treasurer, maybe to just highlight some of the kind of key things, perhaps. Carol, if you would, from okay. the from that. Thank you. Well, this is probably the the, the boring bit of the of the whole afternoon, and I would, I would just make a plea for us poor accountants that the. This is actually a book as well, but it's not, I don't expect any of you to have read it cover to cover like you probably read Angela's. I mean, it's just, it's just there to say how well uh, CGA has been performing and, and whatever. But there are some key things that I think we can all as members and part of the trustees and the staff be very proud of really. Um, the CGA continues to, to grow from strength to strength, not just in its operational delivery, but also its foundations uh, of, of finance really so our reserves have increased um, and that's not because the aim is is to keep a nice pot of money but it's also to make sure that we have a sustainable organization going forward so the plan to be at the, about the four months operational target has been achieved our aim is to get nearer to the six months though we've not set a timetable for that but again it's about keeping this organization sustainable so perhaps those of you who might have skipped to an odd page or two and saw that we've got £199,000 worth of reserves might, might think we're quite a, a rich organisation. But I, I would say to you, you know, the churn of how we expend that money on all our charitable activities requires that level of support um, because we've grown in staff uh, support during the year from three to five, as well as the breadth of what we're doing. And I think it would be remiss of me not, particularly with the, the last agenda item, to talk about uh, the Elevate project, because that's where the bulk of the um, restricted funds the ins and outs, so to speak, uh, are going through. And of course, we're at a very early stage, but a very important stage with, with that project. And that's, it's a new avenue of work for the CJA. And I think all involved in that process uh, are to be applauded at how, how we've got that off the ground, so to speak. Um, you might, if you've skipped even to the second page of seeing that we've actually got quite a lot of money at the moment. And that's because we're very fortunate. And I've been a charity finance director for years, very, very fortunate. A lot of our supporters um, actually give us the money up, up front in advance and, and substantially up, up front. So that's why we're holding the cash. You don't need me to tell you that interest rates haven't actually been that rewarding in the last period of time, but we've tried and we've got a new initiative about maximizing how we get income from that. And now I want to talk about just one sentence or two about actually a very small item in money on our accounts, but a very important uh, lever for us, and that's the membership income. If you've skipped to the page, you'll see we get about 16K of income from our members. And we've been gradually trying to grow that, that membership, and this is our aim to, to grow it a little bit more as well. And you might think in these, in these difficult times, you know, 
well, wh why are we still gathering that money in from members? But I would tell you that it's a very important lever. And when we actually go out to fundraisers to say that we've got this support from all of you and the breadth of the membership and the, the well, the breadth, the depth uh, of the activity as well really means that when we go to, to funders, we've got a, and we've got this and we've got that. And I think to some extent, uh, the international uh, flavor at the early part of this meeting also shows how, you know, we're, we're developing our, our contacts and our work beyond these shores as well, which I'm hoping will be attractive to uh, other funders in, in the future as well. So, you know, uh, don't, don't look at that 16K over our overall income of 330 and think it's small. Actually, it, it really does pinch above its weight. I've mentioned that we've gone from a staffing of three to five. Uh, they all work very hard to deliver. Uh, and we've had a, a new strategy launched as well. So it's been quite a, a task thinking where the CGA is going to go. But I think we're now on very firm ground for going forwards. That's me done, unless there's any questions. Thanks for that, Carol. So any any questions, folks, at all? And I'm just kind of moving across to see if I can see anyone who's got any questions at all. I'll have a quick look at the chat, see if you've got any questions there. Um, I don't think there appear to be at the moment, Carol. Okay. So, um, there's just one other thing we formally yeah. have to do, and that's appoint the independent examiner. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Um, previously, we've been very fortunate in the last few years of getting pro bono support for that through connections of Nina's and my, my own. But the time has come with the organisation, the size it is, to actually go out and actually pay, pay for someone to, to do it. And I think that will, again, support some of the grant applications that we put in. So we do need the uh, members to approve the uh, appointment of Brandt Accounting as our independent examiner. And Brandt has got two A's for whoever's taking the minutes as well. That's it okay. from me. Okay, thanks a lot, Carol. So, um, so in terms of uh, approving, let's just approve the, the last thing that Carol mentioned, which is about the independent examiner. Uh, can we, again, see a show of hands from, from members just to uh, agree that? Okay. And presumably a, the accounts at the same time. Let's have and, one and, and the, and the Yeah, let's do the accounts and the independent examiner at the same time. So you don't have to kind of raise your hands twice, folks. So if you if, if all members could do that, that'd be really helpful. Uh, I'm just kind of just looking down here. Um, okay, I think. Thank you for that, folks. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So um, the, the next part of the of the formal business is um, the kind of rolling trustee resignations and, and, and reappointments. So you've had a, a short paper about that. Um, so at this point, because, uh, well, in fact, both myself and Carol are, are up for resigning, uh, not permanently, hopefully, but resigning and then possibly be reappointed. I'm going to hand over to Nina just to chair this little this part of it. Okay, so uh, uh, over to, to you, Nina. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, this was shared with members. So uh, as Kevin was explaining, part of our memorandum and articles uh, requires trustees on a rotating basis to um, to retire and then uh, to resign and then be reappointed. Um, so this so we've got three resignations, uh, Tebison Rashid, Kevin Wong, who's our chair, and Carol, who you've just heard from our treasurer. Uh, Tebison, unfortunately, due to uh, personal circumstances, um, is uh, going to resign and not be reappointed. Um, so we really thank Tebison for all her uh, work this year. And also um, we've had Caroline uh, Drummond, who's one of our trustees, was one of our trustees resign this year as well. Um, so we really do thank them both um, for all their hard work and their support. Um, but we would like to put the membership to reappoint our chair, Kevin Wong, um, and our treasurer, Carol Hodson, and their biographies have been shared. So I will stop sharing there. So if we, people could, uh, again, indicate that they'd be happy for Kevin and Carol to be reappointed by putting their hands up, that would be fantastic. I think you're back in, Kevin and Carol. We haven't got up, you haven't got off that easily. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think so you perhaps ought to do Kevin stroke Carol and two votes, just in case there was some. <laughs> 
Okay, Doug, Doug, I'll, hand, Doug, I'll hand back to you, Kevin. Okay, Doug, thanks very much for that. I think also uh, it's worth also noting, I think, that um, in terms of uh, other colleagues who've uh, this year uh, um, re resided as trustees, we, we have also uh, uh, Kimberly, I think, uh, who also resigned this year, one of our other trustees. But we've, I think we've noted that we've also thanked all of our trustees who resigned from Institute for their support and, and help uh, in that time. Um, okay. okay. Um, so, I think the, the the last formal item here, I suppose, is in relation to um, to, the, to the director's update. Nina, if you have something you you just want to kind of maybe just talk through, I think we have a bit of time actually, a little bit of time. So, if you want to uh, uh, just give a, an update. Excellent. And, and just to say on the trustees, yes, absolutely. Sorry, I forgot uh, uh, Kimberly, who um, made a huge contribution. And yeah, thank you to all our trustees. And just to say to people that we will be going out shortly to recruit new trustees. Um, so it would be great to um, have member organisations. If you're interested in becoming the trustee of the CJA, um, feel free to contact myself or, or Kevin uh, yeah, to, to find out more. But there will there'll be more of recruitment sort of, um, of, of trustees coming. So um, please do consider getting involved. Actually, sorry, um, Nino, I just realised there's one other trustee who also this year retired as well. I think it was Nadine earlier on in the year uh, as well. Um, and that yeah, was the within this year. year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, anyway. Okay, yeah. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I circulated this, but just uh, briefly, my director's update. Um, so as we've talked about, we've just finished our Erasmus uh, programme, which was slightly delayed, obviously due to the pandemic, but great to be able to actually go and visit uh, Slovakia, the Netherlands um, and the Czech Republic, uh, learning more about um, systemic change and hopefully sharing some of that with you today and going forward. Um, we're continuing to articulate a shared vision for change under our different pillars of safe, smart, person-centred, restorative, trusted. Uh, so I've outlined our different work in these areas. Um, in particular, we've done a lot of work um, under the person-centred pillar, uh, particularly focused around people leaving prison. Um, our last members meeting, as you may remember, um, was on employment advisory boards. And it's great to hear Maria saying to me just when she joined the call that uh, that, that led to some positive uh, connections for, uh, for her and St Giles, which is great. Um, and we've been working, it's great to have Lorraine on the call with Design Against Crime at Central St Martins um, with uh, MBA students on a system design project looking at improving access to employment for people leaving prison. Um, I met with, now this is very out of date, you know, the, the former Justice Secretary um, at the Conservative Party Conference um, and have been also working with uh, the Labour Party and the Fabian Society. Um, so working with think tanks and working with um, parliamentarians and policy makers. Um, we've also done a lot of work in the pillar of restorative, um, particularly around in the lead up to uh, hopefully uh, the long awaited victims bill. Um, and we were delighted that the Justice Select Committee took on board many of our recommendations. So I think Hannah's on the call, our senior policy officer, who's been doing some fantastic work um, looking at how we can improve the victims bill to increase access to restorative justice to get that national action plan that we were talking about earlier that Veronique mentioned was, uh, was there in the Netherlands and to really get um, much more um, access to restorative justice and restorative um, approaches across our criminal justice system. Um, and also we've been continuing our pillar around a trusted criminal justice system, in particular around the um, draft police race action plan, um, and also in promoting and launching our report, again, that Hannah worked on um, towards race equality, which was a, a long project that we worked with in partnership with the IMB, who are the community members who go into prisons uh, looking at conditions in prisons um, and we focused on racism um, that was happening in women's prisons and the experiences of black Asian minority ethnic women in prison and got some um, good coverage of that and are continuing to follow up those those recommendations. Our second strand is about coordinating collaborative working uh, so we're looking forward to having our first research symposium um, and the provisional date for that is the 4th of March um, and we're working in partnership with the University of Westminster on that on the theme of a trusted criminal justice system so bringing together people working in policy practice research um, together and we're also going to be making an announcement shortly about our membership and um, opening up our membership to individual um, academic members um, which was a recommendation of our research expert group 
um, and some of you may be coming or may be um, uh, aware of our annual awards, which we're having in person this year, uh, next Friday, in fact, um, in Birmingham. So we're really looking forward to celebrating uh, the individuals and organisations, uh, outstanding individuals and organisations, um, as well as journalists, digital champions and documentary makers uh, next Friday. So follow our Twitter um, and we're also having a videographer there, so there'll be a little video of, um, of the event afterwards for people to, to see as well. So really looking forward to that. On changing the narratives, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot of works in particular, um, supporting the new research by Frameworks UK, um, and obviously with our media awards as well. Um, and Hannah also responded to the Justice Select Committee's inquiry on the public understanding of sentencing, drawing on some of the expertise of our members um, in making that submission. Our fourth area is promoting power sharing, um, and as Carol and, and others were talking about earlier, our Elevate uh, CGS Lived Experience Leadership Programme, which you'll hear about in a few minutes' time from, uh, from NOLA. Um, our Taster Day kicked that off uh, a few weekends ago, um, and on Friday is looking to, uh, we'll be opening applications for that for people with lived experience of the criminal justice system who are working in our sector, um, who want to uh, take part in the 12-month programme in order to um, access and, and move into positions of, of power and influence and leadership. Uh, so we actually heard from uh, Romarilyn Rolston as part of that taste today from the US because uh, I part of Elevate, as many of you will know, was inspired by travels that I had to the States um, and looking at their lived experience leadership development. Um, but we did a lot, Lorraine, of, of that sort of ground up uh, approach to make sure that we weren't just taking one model and, and bringing it here, but actually working with our lived experience expert group uh, and with our Long for Trust um, interns to ensure that the programme really met the needs um, of, of this particular context. And we'll be getting that evaluated as well. And then finally, last but not least, um, our tackling racial inequality aspect of our work, um, which is being headed up by um, Kenya Lam, our um, equalities policy officer, um, has been going great strengths and is now organising uh, the launch of our first toolkit, uh, which will be in January. Um, and we've also um, been working a lot with officials around the public sector quality duty and have got a website page. You can find out more information. Um, and the pictures you can see there is Kenya and Hannah, um, along with Desmond um, and Kojo, two members of the uh, expert group on this program, uh, attending and speaking and doing a workshop at the Runnymede uh, conference recently. Um, so lots going on um, and please do uh, keep in contact with us if you want to get involved in any of those. Uh, bits of work. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Nina. Um, okay. So um, I think that concludes the the kind of uh, more formal parts of, uh, of today's meeting. So thank you very much uh, for that, everybody, uh, for, for voting and uh, also for um, continue, I guess, to, to support um, the, the CJ as an organization. And importantly, I think we, as Carol said, perhaps it's the, perhaps it's, you know, the accounts and everything else, but maybe the, the least interesting part of today's meeting, but nevertheless, it's, it's very important. Uh, and it's important that we, uh, we share that information with members and uh, are transparent in, in all the things that we do. So uh, I'm very pleased to say that we, hopefully we have a bit more time now to, to focus on the last um, uh, elements of the uh, today's meeting, which is, uh, looking at building movements of lived experience leaders. And so uh, uh, we have uh, some input from from Nola, who is our Elevate CGS project manager, who will be joining us, who, who is here, uh, but who's speaking in a moment. Uh, <laughs> but first of all, I think we have uh, uh, MT, I think from uh, the Global Freedom Fellowship in South Africa. Uh, MT, very, very warm welcome. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Good good to see you. you. Yes, um, so, um, so I think I think the way we're working this is that you, you're speaking for about five minutes or so, and then Nola's speaking for about five minutes or so, and then we'll have some kind of questions and comments after that. So, if I could perhaps hand over to you first of all, MT, uh, just for your input, and maybe just tell us a little bit about your organisation. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, my name is Ntitileli Mike. I am from South Africa, Cape Town. I am INN, uh, South African project coordinator and uh, I am heading up the Global Freedom Fellow. So what is the Global Freedom Fellow? Global Freedom Fellowship is um, 
it's a, it's a fellowship that comprises of people with lived experiences, people who are formerly incarcerated from around the world, a program that is grounded in crossing connections um, between uh, leaders from around the world, and a program grounded in the border crossing connections between social change, uh, visionaries, and um, legacies of incarceration, the fellowship natures. Um, we are looking to be a change makers to foster a sense of struggle and success, to combat a stigma uh, against people who have been in prison, and then ultimately instigate uh, innovative justice work um, worldwide, you know. So the Freedom Fellow will be host or the hub will be in South Africa. As uh, Nelson Mandela once says that um, in, my, in my country, first go to prison and then you become the president, you know, and uh, hence we, we are hosting it here in South Africa because the country has been built around that, has been built by people who spend some time mm -hmm. in confinement, who spend some time in, in the prison sector. And without them and having these conversations and having these negotiations inside, our country would have been in flames. So hence we are having this Global Freedom Fellow, having these like-minded leaders, you know, the focus being on them. And then having this, um, to, make, to make the work that they are doing in different perspective to be a joy, you know, than feeling that it's a, it's a burden, you know, because the work of a justice, it's a work of someone who never sleeps. You know, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, I'm based in Cape Town. Yeah, um, so I have a lived experience uh, as well. Um, I've spent some time uh, in prison, and then I've seen most guys and most of the issues that you've touched here, especially issues of recidivism, issues of restorative justice, um, issues of poverty and crime. You know, those are. Uh, are marriages, you know, it's like a marriage, poverty and crime, they tend to go together. I've seen them and I've seen guys who are well, well, well focused and studying, but not having any opportunities because they are being um, uh, looked over because of their criminal records, you see. So yeah, it's these, these problems that we have, um, they, they are unique to me, but I kind of understanding that now they're not only happening to me, but they are actually a global problem that needs to be tackled, you know, and be given attention to. So, yeah, I'll stop now. And uh, thank you um, so much. Hello, um, hi everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Nola Sterling. I'm the project manager at CJ for the Elevate CJS program. Nice to see you, MT. We've been to and throwing on the phone. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned stigma because I was just on a panel about enriching boards with getting on board and stigma was a big thing um, and also as part of the Elevate programme which Neela touched on which definitely does have its roots in something international and about that knowledge exchange and how we can learn internationally from other people. It's a 12-month comprehensive programme and it's built to break down the barriers first of all and stigma and tokenism and mainly for us to reimagine who can be a leader and it's about helping people build up their professional development so they can become leaders for change and so they can kind of affect the system so um, it's really important that we help break down those barriers and we hope that with all the work that we're doing we're able to do that um, just a little bit about the program because I know we're pressed for time. It's broken down into four modules. Uh, it's a very comprehensive course. The first module is Awakening the Leader Within. And that's when we're looking at all the interpersonal stuff. A lot of times when we look at leadership, we kind of skip to like what we think are the nuts and bolts, what do you need to be a great leader? But a lot of that work happens within. And from our peer research, it came up that we, we really want to build up that people having the audacity to take up space. So we kick off with a residential and we have two wonderful facilitators. Some of you may know Sandra Barefoot from the Forgiveness Project. She's going to be doing some work on shame resilience. And shame resilience is kind of like a trauma-informed approach. 
but it looks at shame and kind of acknowledges that we can't get away from shame. It's all around us, but how do we become resilient to it? And a big part of leadership is us being resilient and role modeling that for other people. And then we have Ade Adenji, who's been trained by Brene Brown. Some of you may know her, Vulnerability and Shame. She's done a very famous TED Talk and he's going to be working on daring to lead. So if you kind of, I hate the term, but for lack of a better term, thinking about things like imposter syndrome. So while anybody on a personal development journey is going to have moments when they feel that, I feel like if you have a lived experience of the criminal justice system, that's going to be impacted further. So we really want to work on that before we get into the part of kind of building up people's capacity for leadership so the second module is learning new concepts and that's when the bulk of our online workshops and in-person workshops will run we have loads just to give you a flavor well Nina mentioned frameworks frameworks will be um, delivering some work about how to frame your own narrative and um you know, learning how to take authority of your narrative and what to say and what not to say, which is really important. I know, MT, we had a conversation about that, about learning how to deal with the media. We also have media training um, and we're going to have some stuff around policy. And for those people that maybe want to go more social entrepreneur route, we'll have um, David Morgan, who is a fellow uh, Churchill Fellow and he's going to be delivering some work around um, self-employment and um, you know uh, social entrepreneur um, stuff and then the third module is all about when people get the opportunity to really cement their learnings and practicing that learning so we'll have a second residential and we'll be doing some um, systems planning uh mapping which is amazing Nina and I were at Burt University I think about four weeks ago with Jocelyn um I thought I was going to be over like kind of watching <laughs> but I ended up participating which was amazing and people were drawing these great maps of the system and I think it's a really powerful exercise um just kind of using those pictures to kind of map out the system and really really want people to map out the system so they know which part of the system they would like to change so that will be happening um, our partners at Westminster will be joining us to supervise an action research project because I think it's really important at the end of this program that people have got a tangible piece of work for themselves so they might respond to a piece of policy they might want to have a go at doing a podcast um, or start up a small campaign and the academics at Westminster will support that there's also a uh, work placement and the work placement will be a senior leadership placement. They will be shadowing somebody, but to make that placement meaningful, people will be contributing to a small project. So they're not just kind of following somebody around about their daily business. And then we also have an opportunity for people to be on shadow boards. I personally think it's a great way to look at an organization from a more strategic governance um, point of view, especially if you've been operational and you've been doing client facing roles. And at the end of that opportunity, for those who would actually like to be a trustee, there will be the opportunity for them to do that. Um, and then in the last module, it's kind of like when the project, project wraps up and throughout the project, there'll be clinical supervision and coaching. And while the two kind of intersect and overlap, the idea is that the clinical supervision will provide a therapeutic space for people to talk about things that could be triggering or things that will come up for them because it is a rigorous program and we do acknowledge that you know people might need that therapeutic space we have a wonderful clinical supervisor um, who's been doing uh, work in the criminal justice system for 15 years and um, she has a great understanding of the work so that will be amazing and then in terms of coaching um we will our partner spark inside will be delivering the coaching throughout the course so people can use that to kind of uh, narrow down at the end of the 12 months what kind of direction they want to go in and what part of the system they would like to change we will definitely be having a celebration after that long 12 months and it will be a time for people to kind of reflect on what they've learned finish off their reflective journals um, that they'll be doing throughout the year and then there's a small bursary of between three and five hundred pounds the people that want to can continue their professional development or have some seed funding to start something up so yes that's a little snapshot of the program um i think that uh 
NT and I wanted to speak a little bit about um, the value and the benefit of um, building global networks. Um, are you on mute still, um, MT, or can you, can you, do you want not, to chip in? Oh, okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> yeah, no, so no, I, no. no. <laughs> so I know, um, actually, just given the, uh, the, the bit of a synopsis on the programme, when I spoke to you and Bass, you mentioned that, um, your program is about, you know, the joy and kind of, uh, you know, um, building those networks, those uh, sister and brotherhoods. Do you want to share a little bit about that, about the power in that? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we we tend to do, we tend to work in isolations, mm. you know, and we tend to think that our work actually is only unique to me. It's only relevant to me. But when I come to understand that, you know, in a broader context, you understand, and when you start to follow the history of imprisonment as well, we start mm -hmm. to realize that, you know, all over the world, you know, we are facing the same challenges, you know, and then having the understanding of that global context, it helped me to understand that when I woke up in the morning, I woke up and being intentional. Because I know that if I am lacking some, or I'm lacking certain information, my brother or my sister, might be having an answer to it. So instead of me working in my in my sorry, in my own silo, I work yeah. in collaboration with my brothers. And I can be able to have somebody to call into and say that, listen, we are experiencing this kind of a challenge. How did you deal with it? Or how yeah. best can I deal with it? Now with this, now um, having this community, it helps you actually to be intentional about the work of justice to help those who are, um, are directly impacted by it, you know. Yeah. And it is always it is, it is it is always good because that is a game changer. Yeah, I remember um, when we had a conversation, we were talking about sometimes it's nice to have somebody to bounce ideas off and just for that kind of camaraderie. And I love that fact that you said that, you know, justice work will keep you up. I mean, sadly, it is true. Uh, people are definitely not in this sector for the money. It is more of a vocation than a job. And it is really great when you know that you've got like-minded people that you can bounce off. And um, just to add to that MT, when we had our taste today two weeks ago, um, a lot of the feedback that we got when we were asking people what, what they really liked, a lot of people was like, I really enjoyed being in the space with people with similar experiences to be and seeing the different things that they're doing in the sector and they really enjoyed networking and building those networks so I think that that's really crucial and key and we shouldn't underestimate that power and I think doing that globally is really amazing I mean I was privileged enough to go on the Erasmus trips I got to go to Retreat and um, Prague and it really opened up my eyes in terms of how we can do things differently and what we can learn from each other because I think no man's an island and we're always learning. Yes, no, that's true. Um, that's true on what you are saying, you know. Um, like tomorrow we are running an event uh, in Cape Town which we call it Locked Out. And the whole idea of running this event actually is to address the unfair employers uh, practices they use towards people mm -hmm. that have, have a lived experience. And um, in South Africa, that is not a law for somebody to have access to your, to, your, to your information. But yet for some odd reason, the companies, they do have access to your information, wow. you know? And for taking a picture, you can sue me just for taking a picture and put it on social media. But for mm -hmm. taking my whole information, I cannot sue you. So that is, that is the unfairness that you are talking about, do you understand, yeah. in South Africa. And that will need a collaboration of, of minds, do you understand, yeah. coming and working together, do you understand? So that is, that is, those are the practices that we need to change. But I know that they are not only relevant in South Africa. I know that UK might be facing the same thing. America might be facing the same thing, do you understand? But yet we say that we want a safer communities, but how do we create a safer communities when we've got them and us yeah you know, so i think that I, one thing that i got from you is that it's about thought leaders as well and um when we think of skill sets sometimes we don't appreciate that some people have great ideas and um 
we could learn a lot from them in terms of it's really interesting to hear your experience about the employers because over here we have something called a DBS check and that basically is a criminal record check and depending on what sector you're working in especially if you're working with um, what we would define vulnerable people maybe like young people um, or marginalized groups you would need that and that is a real big barrier and even at the taste today we had a panel discussion I will see if I can link in the chat the um, blog and um, you know that came up somebody said you know I'm having to explain uh, what I was thinking when I was a 16 year old boy and this is somebody in their 40s it's um it's, it's really, really bad. Um, and that's yeah. why as part of the Elevate programme, as well as building up that capacity and that personal and professional development, we'll be working with employers and building toolkits on best practice, which yes. kind of makes me angry sometimes because I think it's just about dignity and respect. But, you know, we have to learn how, we have to teach people how to cultivate enabling environments, environments that are, um, you know, uh, conducive for people with lived experience. So there's no point in kind of equipping people to be um, great leaders. And then when they go into organizations, they're felt they're met with hostility. So um, thank you so much, Hannah. Hannah's posted the blog in the chat. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's really interesting how you mentioned that about the employers, because we're doing that so we can share ideas on that. Okay. That would be really good. I'm just wondering, folks, so thanks very much, Nola and MT, for, for that input. Uh, really interesting to hear that exchange between yourselves, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just conscious of time, um, so I'm just having a look on the on the chat. I don't think we have uh, any kind of thoughts or particular questions or comments, perhaps, to, to MT or Nola. I guess that if anyone does have anything, they can always uh, perhaps... Uh, email Nola or, or Nina at the CJA, and we can always pass that on and deal with that later. I just wanted to hold back a little bit of time, uh, just to thank everyone for all the all the uh, the people who provided an input today. Um, I know that some people have, I think, probably have already left, but just thank everyone for for their input. Uh, also, thanks to Nina and the CJA team for uh, pulling together uh, this event uh, and making it happen. Uh, I should say, actually, and I think we don't often get a chance to publicly say this, is just to uh, thanks to uh, to my fellow trustees, really, for their time and contribution and efforts to the to, to the CJA. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think we, as, as Nina mentioned earlier, uh, we do have the CJA Awards uh, next Friday in Birmingham. Uh, so it'd be great to, to see to see you all there, if possible. And uh, then, I th then I think we sort of want... And then I think in terms of uh, anything else, I think I don't think we have anything else uh, scheduled, do we, Nina? Unless we have the next members meeting, which will be in the new year. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That'll be in the new year. So yeah, just the the awards next uh, next week for the people that have been shortlisted. But as I said, we will be sharing it on social media. So yeah, yeah. do follow it on on that. That's that's great. Okay, so. Um, Thanks very much, folks. Thanks for, for all the input that everyone's given. Uh, it's, it's very good to see uh, members at th these meetings and also for the input from all our, of all our, our speakers. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Uh, I guess all we would say is I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day and whatever daylight you have, actually. It's quite sunny here in Derbyshire, which is a bit of a change. I hope it's the same for yourselves. Uh, and uh, take care, and we'll see you at the next uh, CJA meeting. So thank you very much, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.